Hey everybody, welcome to Northwoods Online. I'm Kyle Schultz, Associate Pastor of Northwoods Online, and I'm really excited to have you with us here this weekend. Uh, as we head into our service, I just wanted to remind you about one quick thing, that we have our online chat available for you because we really want to get to know you guys better. So join in the chat today on either northwoods.online or on Facebook Live. Our online hosts are available for you to chat with, so and they can help you with answering questions or any prayer requests you may have, so please join in the chat today. So we're in the final week of our 21 day fast. And I don't know about you guys, but the last 21 days has really been great for myself and for my family. So heading into today, Pastor John is gonna be taking us through the table of revival. And with that, we're gonna be looking with fresh eyes on what it looks like to be revived with our faith and our walk with Christ. But before we head into the service, I just wanted to remind you about one quick thing. Next weekend is our baptism weekend. And here at Northwoods, Baptism Weekend is probably our one of our favorite weekends here at Northwoods, where we get to see people come to uh, our service and get baptized and really see a renewed life with Christ as a result of that. So we're really excited for that. So mark your guys' calendars for next weekend. And if you guys are wanting to join in on our Baptism Weekend, you can email me at kyle.schultz at northwoods.church today, and um, I can get you guys set up with an appointment for that service next weekend. So Josh and the band are ready to go. Uh, so turn up your speakers and sit back because we're excited to get started because Northwoods Online starts right now. Hey, Northwoods family. In the first book of Peter, we're told that Jesus bore our sins on the cross. And because of that, by his wounds, we are healed. So together, let's declare that truth over our lives today. Come on. Whoa. Chains are gone, gone. And now my sin is dead and gone, and I sing hallelujah. Done, done. He is risen and he's done, and I sing hallelujah. Oh, oh, oh. Go and sing praise. The praise is a weapon that will overcome. 
is good. His love endures from generation to generation. This morning, if you don't know his love, our desire is that you would come to understand the depth, the width, the greatness of the love that he has for you. No matter what you've done, no matter what you've been, the Lord loves you. Before I spoke a word, Lord, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Yeah. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life to me. You have been so, so kind. this truth sink in. When I was your foe, still your love fought for me. Thank you, Lord. You have been so, so good to me. Yes, you have. When I felt no worth, you paid it all.
listen, I'm so excited about this song because it allows us to decree and to declare some things on this morning. Are you ready? The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Because the God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. I say that again. I said, My God will never fail. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory for the
up to something good and there's breakthrough coming to this place. You believe that? Come on, you believe that? Come on, let's continue to worship our King. He is worthy, yeah. Come on, let's sing it all together. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. And see how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. thank you for all that you are doing and we thank you for the many blessings and the many freedoms that you have given each and every one of us and God we bring those to you today as an offering of thanksgiving I ask that as we continue to worship you that you use our tithes and our offerings to further your plan and your work in Jesus name amen you may be seated and as you are I want to invite the ushers forward to begin receiving today's offering and while that's happening, I want to take this opportunity to welcome you to Northwoods today. My name's Josh, 
and I'd love to meet many of you out in the lobby after and just hear from you, what has the Lord been doing for you during this most recent 21-day fast? For me, God's been teaching me that I rely a lot more on food than I probably need to, and I need to rely more on him. But I'll be out in the Connection Center after. I love to hear stories about what God's doing in your life. Love to meet you out in the Connection Center after service. When you arrive today, you should have received this document. If you guys can kind of take that out and look it over, there's a lot of different opportunities for you to take a spiritual next step. One of those is the Understanding Israel course that Pastor Cal talked about last week. So the, the thing about our spiritual walk is that it's a journey. And journeys take place one step at a time. So what's next for you? Perhaps what's next for you is baptism. I remember at age 11 when I made that decision to be baptized. It's a day I'll never forget. But what's important to note is when I made that decision to be baptized, that did not save me. I'd made that decision several years prior. In the same way that my wedding ring does not make me married, baptism does not make me saved. But both are very important symbols of a decision that I've made. So if you were one of the 1,900 plus people who took a yes packet at Christmas, or if you've never made that decision to be baptized, next weekend is your opportunity. And I'm gonna be right alongside you celebrating because it's a day that you're never gonna forget. That's next weekend. Two weekends, Pastor John's gonna kick off a new series titled Unhappily Ever After. Now we're having a little bit of fun with that series title, but the truth is, Marriage can be hard at times, and it can take a lot of work. So we're excited to bring our friends back in from Pure Desire Ministries. Pure Desire works with churches to help us understand God's plan and purpose for sexual purity in our lives. As you can see on the screens, we're gonna be offering several different opportunities for you to understand what God's plan and purpose for sexual purity is in your life. I hope you're able to make at least one of those gatherings. Well, that's it for the announcements. Let's continue with the service. Great to see you again this weekend. And hey, today is a great day because it is the end of a 21-day fast and we celebrate all that God has done in our lives and is going to do. And hey, just wanna let you know as, as we're talking about celebrating all that God has done in our lives over the past 21 days, I'm pretty aware that there's probably some of us who would say, you know what, the past 21 days wasn't really thought, wasn't what I expected it to be. I didn't feel like, I just didn't feel like I went to another place in my relationship with the Lord. There's some things I'm praying about that I didn't really see anything change. And I just wanna remind you, if that's you, I've been there before, that even when you can't see God's hand, you can still trust his heart and know that he is a good God. And so I wanna encourage you to keep pressing in to him and just remember that sometimes there's times where some of the seeds that we've planted, some of the things that we've been praying about in the fast, that even if they don't happen in that 21 day window, there's many times where we see them come to fruition later on in the year. And so I wanna encourage you and just remember that you serve a good, good God and to keep pressing in 
to him. Now, real quick before we kind of get started today, just something to remember as we come out of the fast. If you're one of those who um, engaged in the fast in a really high level, meaning you've barely eaten over the past three weeks, as much as you might want to, do not go out and just gorge yourself, all right? You do that, you could end up in a world of hurt. So hey, listen, I used to live in Galesburg for all of our Galesburg family. That means, hey, don't run down to the packing house and get yourself a big old steak, baked potatoes, cinnamon rolls. Don't, don't do it, right? If you shut your stomach down, do not just fill it up with whatever you want. You need to ease your way back out of the fast so you don't end up hurting yourself. So just want to throw that out there. And uh, with that being said, let's jump into uh, the series today as we close it out, Lord of the Tables. You know, I recently came across the story of a vibrant 70-year-old woman who I believe seems to have won the award for worst day ever. This true story goes that there was a 70-year-old uh, woman who had just come home from the hospital and she was fresh off of hip surgery. Accustomed to living alone, she was hobbling towards the kitchen to prepare a meal when she realized that she had forgotten her glasses in her bedroom. So she's on crutches and she's got a leg kind of up like this and she's in the doorway and as she turns around on crutches to turn around and go back, she slams her ankle on the doorway and feeling an immense amount of pain in her ankle, she called her daughter and her daughter ended up driving her back to the hospital where doctors discovered that she had broken her ankle. So understand, she's just fresh off of hip surgery and now she's got a broken ankle. After the doctors set her broken ankle, ankle she was released to go home. But upon arriving home, she remembered that the garbage man would be coming the next morning to collect the trash. So she grabbed a small sack of trash and headed outside along with her house key. And so as she's kind of crutching her way to the end of the driveway where she's got a, one of those metal trash cans, metal barrel out front, she kind of does one of these, right? She kind of throws the trash can in, uh, throws the trash bag in, the trash can. Problem is that when she threw that sack of trash into the barrel, her house key went right along with it. <laughs> now understand, the woman was quite short. She's fresh off of hip surgery, had a broken ankle, and it was a pretty big metal trash can. But she could kind of see the key, so she decides she's gonna try to reach in there and figure it out. So as she's leaning over this trash can trying to get it, she ended up getting stuck. Stuck, hanging over the side of the trash can. Thankfully, a neighbor saw her hanging over the side of the barrel and ran out to help her. And after hearing her complain that her side was hurting, he drove her back to the hospital and the hospital ended up treating her for a cracked rib. And then the hospital decided, I thought this was funny, they decided to keep her overnight for observation, right? It's just code for, hey, we ain't letting you leave here again because we don't want to see you break anything else today. You know, I read that story and I'm reminded that young or old, sick or healthy, while we may not have had, you know, a day exactly like that, the truth is we've all had days that feel like that. Those days where we just, we can't just, we just can't seem to catch a break. Those type of days where the hits just keep coming and we get beat up and worn down. And sometimes, you know as well as I do, it feels like those days can turn into months. Some of you listening might even say, uh, hey John, that was my entire 2019. That's what the last year was like. And it's in those times when we're beat up and worn down that God invites us to pull up to another one of his tables. So in this series, if you've been with us, you know we've talked about how God sets tables and invites us into deeper fellowship at the table of renewal. We've talked about how he flips tables and drives out things that don't belong in his temple at the table of removal. We've talked about how he turns tables and completely changes the outcome events at the table of reversal. And today, as we close out this series, we're gonna talk about how 
God empowers us with fresh strength and invites us to walk in newness of life at the table of revival. Revives our soul. And you know, some of you, some of us have found that over the last 21 days as we've spent time at the table communing with God, and it just, it just renews us. There's something that happens there. And I wanna encourage you that don't just let that be those 21 days. Continue coming to the table and continue to commune with God daily and you'll find that as you do, as you make that a habit, a normal part of your daily life, that God brings, he gives fresh strength and he, and he brings about revival to our heart and our soul. So as we talk about this table, we find this table in the second half of one of the most familiar and I believe beloved passages in all of scripture and all the Bible. It's Psalm 23, many of us know it by heart and in this Psalm, David uses the metaphor of a shepherd and his sheep to describe how the Lord takes care of those that are in his flock. Listen to what David says in Psalm 23. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So David starts by talking about the abundant life he experiences with the Lord who is his shepherd. But then as he continues, we find that it goes from kind of this peaceful setting to a more of a dangerous setting in verse four, because look at what he says. He says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So we find that David, just like us at times, had those, had those times where he experienced distressing days where he was he's walking through the valley and he didn't know, am I, am I gonna make it through this? can't see the other side, but it's even in those times that David kept his confidence in the Lord to guide him through. And then as he continues in verse five, he says this, he says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows, surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So David closes by telling us that the good shepherd not only guides, but he provides for his own. Now, there is so much in this psalm that we could cover, but today I really want to focus in on verse five, where he says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Verse five, where we hear of this table, because as we dig in I believe we find that there's something that happens at the table as we commune with God that revives our soul and brings fresh strength and renewed faith. What is it that happens at the table? Well, we start by finding that at the table, we are reminded who we are. At the table, we are reminded who we are. Let's look back at Psalm 23 and verse five. It says, you prepare a table before me. You prepare a table before me. Now understand that in the summer, Middle Eastern shepherds would lead their flocks sometimes to higher mountain terrain. And those were sometimes referred to as the tablelands. So kind of get the picture in your mind of almost a mesa. You know, it's got a flat top, but think of it as having, it's just lush green grass. And the shepherd, when he would lead his flock to the tablelands, he would actually go and prepare the table. What's that mean? That means he would go out and he would remove any poisonous weeds or grass that could harm his flock. He's going and he's looking for are there any any holes where there could be snakes living that could come up and and bite the sheep as they're eating, right? He's, He's going and in essence, the shepherd would literally prepare the table. And in the same way, the Lord prepares a table for us. And so, in keeping with the theme of this series, I want you to picture today a literal table. A table just like this one that has been lavishly prepared. You know, when I think of a table that has been lavishly prepared, I think back to times in my childhood when it would maybe be a time around the holidays 
or we would have another family over, or we'd get together with some of our extended family, right? When that would happen, the table would be lavishly prepared. But the problem was, is when we would get together with a lot of people, extended family, there would never be enough room for everyone to sit at the lavishly prepared table. So inevitably, what would happen is someone would go dig around in a closet and they'd find one of these, a card table, right? They'd find the card table, and this isn't the card table that we had growing up, because the one we had growing up, like one of the legs broke off of it, because it's so junky, right? But they'd bring it out and say, oh, hey, this is the table that grandma and grandpa used to play on when they were little. Don't you want this one? Right? You, you have one of those tables? You have one of those tables that you ever bring out when, hey, someone's coming over, you have enough room, Right? And what would happen at that table, the card table, is the adults would generally get the lavishly prepared table, and the kids, you know, they sit at the card table, the card table in the side room. And here's why I think that happened. Because you know what? If you make a mess at the card table, it's okay. It's just the card table. Not a big deal. If you're eating spaghetti, a little bit of sauce, a little bit of spaghetti falls off your, your fork, it's okay because this table doesn't have grandma's homemade table runner across it, right? This is just the card table. It's okay. We can wipe that right up and we'll just stick it back in the closet. You know the table I'm talking about. There's the lavishly prepared table and then there's the card table. In other words, the card table was for the ones who, you know, a little bit messy and they're not quite mature enough to participate in the adult conversation. So now, with that idea in mind, I want you to imagine a scenario with me for a moment. I want you to imagine with me for a moment that the Lord has invited you and several others to his house for a meal. You walk in and you find that the table, much like the one we have back here, has been lavishly prepared. As you get that picture in your mind and as you imagine that, let me ask you, when you walk in, do you have a seat at the big table, the lavishly prepared table, or would you probably have a seat at the card table? Which one do you have a seat at? Is the big table just reserved for spiritual giants? Or, you know, or could you sit there? What table do you see yourself sitting at? Are you sitting at the card table? The reason I ask that is because the table we see ourselves sitting at, I believe, says a great deal about our perception of ourselves. In other words, do we see ourselves as a beloved child of God who has a seat at the big table, or do we see ourselves as some sort of second-rate follower who's made a too few many messes to sit at the big table. How do we see ourselves? How do you see yourself? Well, listen, regardless of what you see, David paints the picture of the Lord as the one who invites us to sit at the big table, the lavishly prepared table. Look at what David says. He says, you prepare a table before me. If you are a follower of Christ, did you know that can be your declaration also? In fact, I'd encourage you to put your name in place of me. You prepare a table before John. You prepare a table before Emily. You prepare a table before Andy. You prepare a table before Lynn. You prepare a table before me. And as we do that, you know what we're doing? We are reminding ourselves who we are in Christ. In other words, it's at the table. We are reminded 
who we are. We're reminded that we aren't the mistakes we've made. We aren't the labels that have been put on us. We aren't the lies that the enemy has tried to sell us. We are God's children who have a place at the table. And this is where walking in newness of life starts. Why? Because we cannot consistently live in a way that is inconsistent with how we perceive ourselves. Did you hear me? We cannot consistently live in a way that is inconsistent with how we perceive ourselves. For example, I want you to think about the movie Lion King. Anybody like the movie Lion King in here? Yeah, right, great movie. Anyone seen the live action one that came out like this past summer? All right, a few of you. It's okay if you haven't seen it. It wasn't as good as the first one, all right? But listen, in a moment, I'm gonna show you a clip from the live action one. But if you remember in Lion King, if you think back, you remember that after Simba's dad, Mufasa, dies in a stampede, Simba's uncle, Scar, convinces Simba that he... Simba is the one responsible for his father's death. Now, if you've seen the movie, you know that that's not true at all. It's actually Scar who has set the whole thing up. But he starts spinning the lie with Simba, and Simba starts believing that he's the one who killed his father. And Simba, believing this, instead of taking his place now as the rightful king of Pride Rock, runs Why? Because he perceives himself not as a king, but as a killer. And so in in this clip, as we pick the story up, Simba has been running for years. He's grown now, and he's been running because he believes he isn't worthy to be king. But then something happens that changes everything. You remember that baboon, Rafiki? Rafiki finds him and Let's watch what happens. That clip gives me the chills every time I watch it. I love it. And you know, if we were to keep playing that, we all know that it's from that moment on that Simba stops running and starts living like the lion he was destined to be. And I show that clip because I believe it perfectly illustrates how we cannot consistently live in a way that is inconsistent with how we perceive ourselves. This is why we must continually pull up to the table and commune with God, be with God, because at the table, we are reminded who we are. And that is beloved children of God who have a place at the table if you have surrendered your life to Christ, let me tell you, you have been adopted into his family, you are a child of God, and you have a place at the table. It doesn't matter where you've been, what you've done, you have a place at the table. You're his beloved child of God. So what happens at the table? We are reminded who we are, but also at the table, we regain perspective. David goes on, he says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Kind of an interesting way to say it because you would think that the Lord would prepare a table in the absence of my enemies. But David said, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. So again, if you think about shepherds, as a shepherd would prepare the table lands for their sheep, The reality is that that table is still in the wild, right? It's still in the presence of predators, wolves, lions that lurk all around looking for an opportune moment to pick off a sheep. So on one hand, we kind of have this picture of peace. You prepare a table before me. But on the other hand, we have this picture of kind of like danger and chaos because it's in the presence of my enemies, You know, those two don't seem to go together. So what is going on here? How does this relate to us? You know, I recently read about the story of American swimmer, Florence Chadwick. Florence was a long distance swimmer and she was the first woman to swim the English Channel both ways. 
So it's, I think it was, it's the body of water that separates southern England and northern France. Long way to swim. But in 1952, she attempted to swim the 26 miles between Catalina Island and the coastline of California. 26 miles, that's a long swim. So as she started to, started to swim, she was flanked by a couple of small boats that were on the lookout for sharks. Now, just a side note, if you're ever going for a swim in a body of water that requires you to have boats following you, looking for sharks, don't swim there, all right? <laughs> At least I wouldn't be swimming there. So she starts out, she's flanked by small boats that were on the lookout for sharks, but were also there to help her if she got hurt or grew too tired to continue. So she starts swimming, and after almost 16 hours of swimming, Florence ended her swim without reaching the California shore. And what made this failed attempt so newsworthy was the reason she didn't make it. The reason she didn't make it wasn't because of the cold water or a pulled muscle. It wasn't the sharks or a school of jellyfish. It wasn't even the physical exhaustion of a 16-hour swim. The reason she quit was fog. After the 15th hour of swimming, a thick fog rolled in and Florence became unable to see the coastline. And once the coastline disappeared, she began to doubt her ability to finish the swim. And so at about the 16th hour, she, was, she asked to be pulled out because she didn't believe she could make it. When she climbed in the boat, she was informed that she was less than one mile from the shore. If only she'd known how close that coastline really was, she could have kept going, she could have persevered. But instead, she lost perspective and gave up. And I share that because what happened to Florence, I believe can happen to any one of us, and that there will be times when the fog, a.k.a. our enemies and our problems roll in, a good plan goes bad, a pregnancy goes wrong, a job is lost, your spouse walks out, a relationship goes sour, a child walks away from the faith, and when the fog comes in, it's easy to lose perspective. And we can begin to believe that Maybe God has abandoned us. And we start saying things like, God, where are you? Do you not recognize everything that is going on around me? Do you even see me? Are you even there? Where are you, God? And it's in those moments that people actually walk away from the faith because they believe if God was really there, this wouldn't all be going on. It's in those moments that it's, we, it's so easy to give up. But look again what David said. He said, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, which tells us that the presence of problems does not equate to the absence of God. Did you hear me? The presence of problems does not equate to the absence of God. You might have all kinds of things swirling around you today. You might feel like, man, I have, there are so many problems going on. And you might wonder, where is God? Can I remind you that even when you can't see his hand, you can trust his heart. He's there. He has not left you. He has not abandoned you. You're his. And he's with you. And if he is with you, he is for you. In other words, it's at the table that we regain perspective and we begin to realize that even in the midst of our problems, that God has not left. He is with us. It's at the table we're reminded who we are. It's at the table we regain perspective, but then we find that at the table, we receive fresh empowerment, fresh strength. 
David says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And then he says, you anoint my head with oil. Now, for a shepherd in in Bible times, it was common practice to pour oil on the head of your sheep and on the soft parts of their snout because the oil would actually keep bugs and flies away. It'd keep flies from landing and burrowing in and laying eggs, something that would be very irritating to sheep. So you would pour oil over their head. And the shepherd would anoint his sheep, and so in a similar fashion, God anoints us. How so? Well, Paul said that for those of us who have surrendered our lives to Christ, he said, God has anointed you, placed his seal of ownership on you, and put the Holy Spirit in you. Meaning God anoints us when we surrender our life to him, he anoints us with the Holy Spirit. In fact, it's pretty interesting if you read on in the Psalms, in Psalm 45, a Psalm that was actually quoted by the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter one. In Hebrews chapter one, speaking of Jesus, he says, he was anointed with the oil of gladness. And we know that Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit, so I think we can make the connection that the oil almost points to the Holy Spirit. And then Paul said that we are to go on being filled with the Holy Spirit, meaning filled continuously. It's something that continues to go on. Now, when we, when we read that go on being filled, I think sometimes it, it can be easy to think that we somehow have to get more of the Holy Spirit. Understand that's not what Paul's saying. The Holy Spirit, you've been anointed with the Holy Spirit, he already lives in you. But the question is, how much of you does the Holy Spirit have? See, if you think about your body as the house, right? The Holy Spirit resides in the house. But does he have access to the whole house? Or is it like, hey, you got the guest room in the basement and that's about what all all you got access to. You know, don't be messing in other areas of my life. Don't don't be trying to tell me how to live this way. You know, I got that figured out. You, You just stay where you need to stay. Does the Holy Spirit have access to the whole house? Are there some parts of your life that are off limits to him? I say that because I believe the degree to which we allow the Holy Spirit to fill us is also the degree to which we will experience his empowerment. In fact, I would venture to say that sometimes we are so worn out trying to accomplish God's purpose for our life because we're trying to do it on our own apart from the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. So think about it like this. If you're a parent and you have children, one of the purposes for your life that God has given you is to raise those children. That's a calling on your life. Now, you know as well as I know if you have children that raising children is very hard. (laughs) It's incredibly tiring at times. But did you know you can try to raise your children apart from the empowerment of the Holy Spirit? I don't know about you, but if if you're gonna raise your children and make it, you and I need the empowerment of the Holy Spirit every day to accomplish that purpose. So that means coming before the Lord and saying, Holy Spirit, again, I can't do this without you. I need your fresh strength. Anoint me afresh. Empower me to fulfill the purpose that you've placed on my life. You know, when I think about being filled with the Holy Spirit, I sometimes think of the tires on a car. Have you ever tried driving with a flat tire? I've had it happen to me a couple times, and if, if you have, you know it doesn't work very well. And that tire is not filled, you know that you're not gonna go very fast, and you're not gonna go very far. And you're gonna hear a lot of extra noise, you're gonna catch unwanted heat, and if you continue driving, you could potentially damage the car even further. And it's the same way with us. When we aren't allowing the Holy Spirit to fill us, 
we're like a flat tire. And that it takes much more effort to roll our life forward and travel the road ahead. But when we get that tired filled, oh, you know, now you're ready to roll. You're ready to travel the road ahead. And it's the same way with us. When we allow the Holy Spirit to fill us and we're cooperating with him, we're empowered in a new way to travel the journey ahead. It's at the table, at the table as we commune with God, that he anoints us afresh and empowers us with fresh strength for the journey ahead. So at the table, we remember who we are. We regain perspective. We receive fresh empowerment. And then lastly, at the table, we recognize that our every need is supplied. David goes on and he says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. My cup runs over. It overflows. It speaks to the idea of the joy and the gladness that comes with realizing the way in which God has lavishly provided for us. That he has provided our every need. We serve a God who supplies our every need. Now, not want, don't hear me wrong, but he supplies our every need. So listen, if you think about maybe the last time you went to a restaurant and you had someone serve you, waiter or a waitress, and you might have heard sometimes when they come up and they start to fill your cup, what will they say? They'll say, just say when, right? And when you say when, right, they're filling your cup, you say when, they stop. Now, just a little trick for you. If you ever wanna just kind of mess around with your server or waitress, okay, have a little fun with them, just don't say when and watch what happens. It's kind of interesting because they start pouring and it's like they want to stop because they're at the top of the cup, but they haven't served when and so they like freeze up and keep pouring and you're like, whoa, 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 what are you doing? You just overflowed. Now, I do it because I think it's funny, but it's also a little mean, I get it. But listen, in that instance, the cup overflowing is an accident, right? Right? But with God, the overflow is not an accident. Because when God supplies your every need, he just continues pouring. His, his love is unending. His grace has no measure. His mercy has no limit. His power has no boundaries. It overflows. Our every need has been supplied. My cup overflows and when I realize the way in which he has provided for me and he has supplied my every need I feel joy well up inside of me because I know he's got me he's taking care of my every need I so you know what maybe there might be some of us who are saying man I just I just don't feel that joy you know I'm just I'm just down I'm sad. You know what? Sometimes I found that when that happens, it means it's time to come to the table because at the table we recognize, we remember, we reflect on the fact that God has supplied our every need. In fact, in Psalm 103, David did this. Psalm 103, he says this. He says, praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Forget not all his benefits. You know, it's January, and there might be some of us who are here who are a little bit mad about maybe the benefit package you got at work this year. But you know what? That means it's time to focus on the greater benefit package where David says this, praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like eagles. Forget not all his benefits. Recognize that our every need has been supplied. And as you do that, you're gonna feel that. You just start to feel the joy inside of you because you know your every need 
has been supplied. So it's at the table that we are reminded who we are. It's at the table we regain perspective. It's at the table that we receive fresh empowerment. It's at the table that we recognize our every need is supplied. And then as we close, I wanna read this last, this last verse six one more time from Psalm 23 because David says, surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I will dwell in the presence of the Lord forever. So think about David. There's many Psalms where he talks about his enemies pursuing him. But here in this Psalm, David's saying, yes, I know that there's enemies that are pursuing me. But he completely flips it. And he says, now it's goodness and love that will follow me. Another word you could use for that there is pursue me. It's the goodness and the love of God that is truly pursuing me. If you think about it in shepherd terms, it's like the two sheepdogs that are chasing after, coming after. His goodness and love is pursuing me and it will pursue me all the days of my life. It's an incredible thing to think about. And so as we close on every campus, I wanna ask you to stand to your feet and I want us to just declare this together because in a way, we're thanking God for his love and goodness, but we're also reminding ourselves that his love and goodness are pursuing us. So I'm gonna read this and I want you to repeat after me. You bring the energy, all right? You just say, thank you, God, that your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I thank you, Lord, that I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Give him praise, give him praise. Thank you, Lord, for your love and your goodness. Guys, thanks so much for being here with us. If you need prayer for anything, you come on down front. We'd love to pray with you. And hey, just wanna remind you that next week it is baptism weekend. We're gonna celebrate. And so if you've recently surrendered your life to Christ, come on out. We'd love to celebrate with you as you take your next step. Have a great week, guys. Northwoods Online, again, thanks so much for tuning in with us. We always love having you. Hey, I just want to remind you that as we head into next weekend, Baptism Weekend, if you've never been to one of our campuses, I really want to invite you. I know there's some of you who maybe can't make it because of your location, but if you've never been, I would encourage you to come on out to any one of our locations and be here with us in-house to celebrate people taking their next step. Even if you don't have to be baptized, even if you're not coming to be baptized, come on out and celebrate with us as we watch people take their next step. Have a great week.